Hi, everyone. How are you? Good morning. Welcome to Hashi Days. Thank you for coming. Um, we, we put a lot of work into this, so we're really glad you're here, and uh, we're really grateful for you being here. So, hope you have a good time, and hope you learn a lot. We want to thank our sponsors, Fastly and Packet. Uh, they're great, and uh, if you need a CDN or bare metal hosting, you know where to go. Um, if you're not on uh, Wi-Fi yet, this is the SSDN password. While you've got your devices out, please take a look at if you have uh, vibrate on or silent mode or make it a little less loud when speakers are coming up. Um, nice if they don't have to uh, hear that. Off they go. If you're tweeting, if you like tweeting, uh, <laughs> you can use the hashtag HashiDays and everyone here will check it or see it. Um, so use that. One, uh, one important thing to uh, note is that we have a code of conduct posted on our website, and that governs the conference, and, and please review it if you have time, um, as it's an important part of uh, all us coming together as a community. Um, if you find anyone with a HashiCorp uh, staff t-shirt, there are kind of your guideposts. If you need help with something, if you need to know where something is, if you have a question about the code of conduct, if you have a question about anything, including HashiCorp stuff, um, they are there. And for, without further ado, please welcome Mitchell to the stage, who, uh, who will be talking about uh, a bunch of stuff. Thanks. All right. Cool. All right, thanks, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first Hashi Days event. Uh, we're doing one more this year, and, and perhaps in the future we'll do a lot more. Uh, we're hoping these will help augment our once a year conference with a more uh, technical and community focus um, than what our multi-day conference would be. Also much less of a commitment, especially if you're local to the area. Um, we're going to have a set of pretty technical talks in the morning, uh, followed by open sessions, so you'll be able to you know, talk about whatever you want to talk about pretty much, um, uh, followed by our users and, and some customers talking about more about how they, in particular, use uh, some of our tools. So I think it's a really nice balance of uh, very deeply technical talks followed up with uh, practical talks, uh, as well as whatever you want to make it in the middle. Um, so at HashiCorp, uh, we're driven uh, by a mission that we bring together as provision, secure, connect, and run any infrastructure for any application. Uh, this is what we're trying to achieve. And our process for uh, achieving this uh, is to build a set of separate components that fit into these categories that you could choose to adopt individually or together, and you get to pick which one is most useful for you uh, at the beginning. Um, so these are the six different uh, open source tools that we offer, and open source is a core sort of philosophy, founding philosophy of the company, and the categories that they are part of are below here, and everyone in here, mostly everyone in here, is familiar with at least one, I'm sure, um, but I'm just going to give a one-sentence description uh, of each of them, just in case uh, there's some that you've maybe seen the logo and you've never really been sure what it does, uh, you've been thinking about, uh, and so on. So Vagrant is our tool for uh, building and managing development environments. It allows you to use uh, the same workflow to build a development environment for any application on any platform for any type of employee. Uh, very predictable, uh, works, works across multiple paradigms like virtual machines and containers. Packer is our tool for building images for cloud platforms, virtual machines, containers, uh, and other things as well, disks and so on. Uh, the goal here is that as platforms change, as you adopt new things, uh, you don't need to build new workflows and processes around building those images. You have, to, you have to learn that thing, but you could still use the same tool, the same commands, the same configuration format in order to build those images for that platform. Terraform is our tool uh, to, uh, to write, plan, create, and maintain infrastructure using infrastructure as code. It supports pretty much every major cloud platform. Uh, and if it doesn't support something, it's very easy to add support for another platform. Uh, it also allows you to manage multiple different targets at the same time. So you could spin up an instance in one cloud, connect it to a separate DNS provider that's not provided by that same vendor, uh, and so on. So if you have if, if you have an organization that uses different vendors, then you can manage it all with, uh, with one tool. Vault is our solution for secret storage, certificates, encryption, uh, and a whole lot, whole lot more in a centralized, uh, secure service. Uh, the aim is not only 
to secure things, but also to enable sort of your organization to delegate more security practices uh, in a way that you could trust so that more of your organization could sort of build secure systems in parallel with each other. Nomad, Nomad is our distributed uh, cluster manager and scheduler. It allows you to deploy containers, VMs, uh, raw binaries, Java, other things, um, all using the same system uh, across multiple platforms. Uh, and console is our service discovery and configuration tool. It, it's distributed, multi-data center, uh, and it answers the really critical question of, you know, where is some service, you know, foo, like a database? Is it healthy? Um, how far away is it latency-wise? Uh, and, and it does that for you. And so together, these are the six tools uh, that make up our tool suite. They're all open source. Um, and in just the past year, so just this year alone, uh, we've shipped more releases of these than we ever have before. We're more productive than we've ever been before. And so we've actually shipped, this is just up to April, actually. Um, up to April, we shipped over 25 releases. Uh, in, in aggregate, these releases have hundreds of improvements, dozens of features. Um, and while open source, and these are all open source releases, and, and while open source is obviously, like I said, a founding core principle of the company, um, we're also building a strong business at the same time. So this year, we've also focused on the three enterprise products we currently sell, which are Terraform, uh, Vault, and Console. And we've shipped uh, a handful of really exciting features in these two. And so these are the six tools. And, and like I said, there's hundreds of improvements, dozens of features. And we completely sort of understand that as members of our community and, and customers, that you, can't, you usually can't keep up with all the different things that are happening uh, at the same time. Um, we could barely keep up on our own. And so what I'm going to do, what I'd like to do today, is go over most of these, highlight one really exciting thing we've done with each of the tools, um, and highlight just in really briefly uh, some, other, some other features we've shipped, just so you could see some of the things we're doing and see some of the sort of guiding themes of the products that we're focused on. We like to build our products um, with a theme at a time. So let's just start with console. Uh, console is an extremely stable uh, piece of technology. It's, it's one of our older tools. It's used at a very large scale. Uh, we now have multiple users and customers using it on hundreds of thousands of machines um, uh, in, in just a single organization. Uh, it, it's sort of hard to count at that point. And, and so at this point, the theme that we've been focusing on for console for, for most of this year has been uh, easing operator tasks, trying to automate things for operators and improve scalability. Um, at the scale that console is now being adopted at, doing those things has a huge leverage factor for the organization. It, it dramatically increases sort of the happiness of using a tool. And uh, the thing I'd like to highlight that we've shipped in console is something really excited, uh, exciting that we've been working on, uh, and it's called Autopilot. Autopilot came out with the last major release of console. Um, and it can be described as the self-driving console clusters uh, as long with, with continuous operator supervision. So the goal of Autopilot is to allow you to, uh, to allow console to automate most of the tasks you would do anyway. Um, and as long as everything looks good, it'll manage it for you. And if something isn't looking good, it'll kick out to an operator. And, so, and most of the time, everything is good. So this removes whole areas of risk um, and, and tedium from an operator. And we split Autopilot down into two different categories of features. The first is what we call the Autopilot safety features. Uh, the safety features are features that are there to protect users and operators um, from either accidentally or purposely sort of doing something to console uh, that could put it in a unstable state or almost unstable state even if it's a, a risk, a compromised state. Um, it's there to constantly watch you and, and protect you. And these features are all in the open source today. If, if you're using the latest version of console, they're actively running. Um, so there's three, initially we shipped three autopilot safety features. Uh, the first is something called dead server cleanup. Uh, dead server cleanup makes it so that when a console server dies, if another healthy one appears, we immediately remove the old dead server from the cluster. Before, you would have to wait 72 hours for it to automatically prune, or you'd have to manually remove it from the cluster. Uh, the risk of this with a, with a server cluster is you could cause quorum issues for leader election. 
So now when a server's dead, as long as there is a replacement healthy server that wasn't there before, uh, we'll swap it out. Uh, the next thing is server health checking. Uh, this is actually just an underlying thing that, that powers some of the other autopilot features, but you do have access to it uh, via an API. It's a set of sort of rich health checks that the leader runs against all the servers um, with various raft metrics, um, timing metrics, networking metrics. Uh, and you could, you could hit an API endpoint to see those. You could hook it up to your monitoring and so on. Um, but that also exists to feed the other features of autopilot, um, namely sta stable server introduction. So uh, stable server introduction is uh, a feature where when you spin up a new console server, it does not become a voting member of the cluster until the health checks pass. Um, so before you would start a new server, join the console cluster, um, and it may not be quite ready for various reasons to actually uh, uh, participate in leader election and, and the cluster itself. And so now console will see it, but will wait for the server health status to go green before it actually promotes it to a voting member of the cluster. And so these are the autopilot safety features. They're always running, uh, and they should dramatically sort of decrease the risk that you put console into uh, a, a compromised state. And then we have enhanced autopilot, which are convenience features uh, to automate sort of tedious tasks and improve scalability for consoles. So these are things that, that should just make an operator happier uh, and automate things. And these are only in uh, the enterprise version of console. And so we also shipped three initial features for enhanced autopilot. Um, the first one is non-voting servers. And so uh, servers are a mechanism to get read scalability in console. You could run the more servers you run, sort of the more read scalability you get. The issue there has always been the more servers you run, uh, the more servers you have participating sort of in the leader election and the quorum, uh, which is a scalability issue. And so we introduced this idea of a non-voting server uh, that you could introduce so that it becomes part of the cluster, but it's non-voting. So it, in it increases read scalability uh, without sort of compromising the quorum. The next thing we added was redundancy zones. Uh, redundancy zones are a way to take advantage of isolated failure domains in a cloud platform, again, without risking sort of the quorum of console. So a great example here is Amazon availability zones. Um, with availability zones, what our users wanted was the ability to, in three availability zones, as an example, run two console clusters, uh, two console servers in each availability zone, so that if one goes down, you always have another locally in your availability zone. The issue there, of course, is, again, odd quorum sizes. Um, six is not a great quorum size. So with redundancy zones, what you could actually do is tell console uh, certain tags on the console nodes that it uses to create these logical zones. So you could actually say uh, on the node that I'm in US East 1, and 1A, 1B, 1C. And then with each, within each zone, console will only have one voting member. So it'll always make sure you only have you know, three uh, three, a quorum size of three, even though you have six servers. And that pairs really nicely with a non-voting server. So you both get read scalability uh, in, a, in a failure domain as well as, as failure isolation. Uh, and the last thing is automatic upgrades. And so with automatic upgrades, upgrading console is, is brain dead simple. You just launch the new version. And when enough of the new ver uh, of servers, you launch the new version of servers. And when enough of them show up, the uh, server switches over sort of almost atomically sort of to the new server set. So you have, let's say you have three on version one, and then you launch version two, and you put three of them. And until there's a quorum of three with the new version, they're sort of non-voting, and they're sitting there. And then the moment there's three, they leader elect, they become a leader, and then the other three demote themselves into non-voting members. Uh, and this works really nicely with tools like Terraform or CloudFormation or sort of any automation, uh, because the upgrade process just becomes launch, wait, destroy versus uh, more of a, a handheld uh, process. And again, you don't risk awkward quorum sizes as part of the upgrade process. Uh, and so this is Autopilot. Um, it's sort of the beginning of what we plan for more of the philosophy behind Autopilot, which is we're just trying to increase over time uh, more and more automation that console could do for you. So things that would fall into this in the future are just things like backups or identifying more scenarios where it could protect you from things. Uh, we intend to continue to, en uh, to enhance Autopilot uh, over time and, and add more features to this. Uh, and then very briefly, here's a couple other things. I'll just say a brief sentence about. Um, in addition to Autopilot, we introduced something called network areas, um, which itself is also an enterprise feature. 
But this allows you to connect multiple data centers of console in a non-fully connected network. So at the uh, console typically requires a fully, con you could connect multiple data centers, but it, it requires a fully connect. They all need to be able to communicate with each other. Um, and at the scale of hundreds of thousands of machines, it's very, very unlikely that all data centers could communicate with each other. You get hub and spoke models. You get much more uh, uh, complicated sort of network topologies. And these network areas allow you to define those topologies and connect all your console clusters through, uh, through those restrictions. Uh, and then the, the last thing here is auto join. Auto join is something in the open source. It makes it really easy to cluster consoles. So what auto join allows you to do is we support both AWS and GCP. Uh, we're looking at supporting more cloud platforms too. But within these, you could just tell console uh, tags to look at. And when the tags match a certain value, we automatically join the cluster based on that. So we actually use um, the inventory of your cloud platform as a way to sort of solve the bootstrapping problem for console. Uh, next is Vault. Uh, with Vault, what we've been doing, our theme for Vault this year has really been about improving scalability, um, but also just about uh, increasing the number of security tasks that you could offload onto Vault. The goal of Vault is to give developers a high-level API to have a security-mindedness and do things the right way in a security setting, um, while giving security engineers and operators uh, the tools to efficiently manage that. And so. Uh, both scalability and increasing the, what it does is a really important aspect of Vault. The, the thing I'm going to highlight here is replication. Uh, replication is a feature that we launched into uh, Vault Enterprise in, I say, January, February this year. Um, and what it allows Vault to do is gain horizontal read scalability. Um, you just launch new Vault clusters. They could be in other data centers. They don't need to be on the local network. Um, and we're able to replicate data to them uh, in a with a security model that, that we do, uh, clearly document and you could understand. Um, this is a really high level like architecture overview. Um, I'm actually not gonna talk about it because Armand's gonna go into detail about how the replication works uh, just following me here. Um, but basically you have two separate, you know, completely separate clusters that each have their own set of actives and standbys and they replicate data uh, to each other. And configuring the replication is as easy as three commands. Um, two to enable, uh, well, one to enable uh, replication in general, one to generate a token that you use with the secondary, uh, and then one that you run on the secondary in order to connect the replication together. Uh, it's extremely easy to get going with replication, and after that, it just works uh, and just connects together. Uh, so what replication allows is primary, secondary um, replication. So it's one to n. You have one sort of authoritative cluster, and you have n reading from it. Um, but the, the n uh, allow you to gain read scalability. All the mounts, secrets, policies, uh, and configuration for those mounts are synced across all the secondaries. So when you mount something on the, the primary, all the secondaries get that mount. The mount appears there as well with the same configuration. Uh, but things like tokens and leases are cluster local. And this in increases the scalability quite a bit because when you request a secret, the, the lease and the life cycle of that secret doesn't need to go back to the primary. It could actually remain local to the secondary clusters. Um, it also makes it important that when you use this, you only talk to the, the same cluster that you're supposed to be talking to. If you're, in, if you're in one data center, you only talk to that data center's vault. Otherwise, uh, your, your auth token won't work across them. Um, and then you could also mark mounts as local only. So both on the primary and the secondaries, you could put mounts there that don't get replicated in any fashion. So things that just don't need, you don't need access outside uh, of a machine, you can mark as local only. Uh, and this, then we have a, a lot more as well planned for replication. So in addition to re replication, the other th part of the theme, like I said, was just increasing the amount of things that Vault could do. Um, with the goal of just offloading more security tasks on, uh, onto Vault. And so one of the really neat things is a TOTP backend. I'm not sure how many developers or, or even operators in here have had to work with developers to integrate something like two-factor uh, into an application. Um, for a developer, it's, it's usually actually pretty non-trivial in the sense that you have to find a library to help you with this. You have to really think through the workflows. Um, and Vault's trying to offload a lot of that for you. So Vault with the TOTP backend uh, will automatically generate TOTP codes for the user uh, and give you an API to check those. And so for developers now, 
integrating TOTB is mostly a UI exercise. It's mostly getting, getting the workflows right and when to call the backend, but they don't need to worry about how do I generate this, how do I store it, things like that. Um, we, we ship the combined database backend, so Vault's always, Vault since 0 0.1 has been able to generate uh, dynamic database credentials for you so that when you need to talk to a SQL database, you're using completely unique new database credentials. And they've been hard-coded into Vault, and over time we've expanded it slowly, added support uh, for more and more database backends. Uh, with the last release of Vault, you could actually do this yourself with plugins. You could write a plugin that exists as a separate process. Um, the security model behind that is all documented, uh, and it allows you to just add support for, for custom databases, or just you want to behave in a custom way with, with a database we already support. You can now do that via plugins. Uh, we're going to extend plugin support for more and more things over time. Uh, and then the last thing is the SSH CA certificate backend, uh, which gives you um, a much better way sort of to manage SSH credentials instead of using uh, public-private key everywhere. You could actually use certificates. And, and one of the biggest uh, challenges behind that in the past has just been the CA to manage those certificates. And since Vault itself has been uh, a full CA for, for years now, uh, we now extended it to also support SSH. So when you SSH into Vault, you could SSH with a certificate, it verifies it with Vault and gives you access that way instead of having to distribute keys. Uh, so next I want to talk about Nomad. Um, Nomad, we have, a, we have a talk couple after this, um, a deep dive on how the Nomad scheduler works. Um, but the theme for Nomad this year has been around enabling more types of workloads, um, enabling more types of jobs to run on Nomad. Um, and the thing that we launched uh, earlier this year is no, what we call Nomad Dispatch. Uh, Nomad Dispatch is a way to register parameterized jobs uh, with a Nomad cluster that could be invoked dynamically uh, via a, a REST API. So they're parameterized batch jobs. They're jobs that run and return at some point. That's what a batch job is. Um, you could think of this kind of as functions as a service. You register something that takes inputs, um, and it may generate an output. It may just do something. But you send it. It's a function call, more or less. Um, and in, in many cases, not in every case, um, but in many cases, you could actually replace uh, queues with this. And the primary case you could replace queues is for long-running jobs. Um, for things like video transcoding or something that takes quite a while, uh, Nomad Dispatch is, is a really good way to do that. Um, over a queue, lowers complexity quite a bit. The way this looks is pretty simple. So here's an example video encoding uh, job. Uh, and in this job, we just have this parameterized block, and the parameterized block tells Nomad what parameters to require, what are optional. Um, and so in this case, we're just saying we require an input. Um, and in this example, this is actually from a blog post we did. In this example, the input uh, is a URL to um, a file to transcode. So this could be an S3 URL or something. Um, and so that's what's required. And to dispatch it, uh, this example is doing it from the command line, but you could also do it from an HTTP API. Um, but to dispatch it, you just say the name of the job, which is video encode, uh, and then give it the metadata that it requires. So in this case, it's an input um, to some URL. Uh, and that will queue it. And if there's not available sort of scheduling space on your cluster, uh, it'll, it'll queue it. And if there's available space, it'll schedule it, place it, run it, uh, and it'll complete at some point. Um, and this is super nice because it lets you use pretty much all the available space in your cluster for running background jobs. Um, and it, as space becomes available. And for machines that don't have space available, they, they won't run. And, and so it's, you don't need dedicated sort of work. You probably do, but you don't need as many sort of dedicated worker machines. You could just use the cluster manager as it should be, which is viewing your data center as a single computer and just saying, register this job with this many resources, uh, and it runs it. And so that was Nomad Dispatch. Uh, we also have rolling deploys. This is actually coming out in the next version of Nomad, but it's, it's it's pretty close here. Uh, but Nomad will support a rolling deploy model that actually uses uh, console health checks as a way to know when to progress and when to stop progressing. So you'll be able to um, have stepped deploys uh, for things. Um, and we also shipped Vault integration late last year. Uh, and Vault integration it gives you a way to uh, get secrets in there securely. And so it, it's all documented online, but how we actually make it so that the secret can only get from Vault to your job uh, to only that job, and it can only get there once, um, and, and all that integration. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is Terraform. 
Um, so with Terraform, uh, there's been a couple things that, there's something that naturally happens, it's not really a theme of Terraform, and that is just growing and growing uh, provider support and resource support. Um, I think we're up to over uh, 75 providers and, and I think over 500 resources supported by Terraform. Uh, and a lot of that is done by the community, and so that, that's a constant thing that happens, which is really great. Um, and what we've been focusing on as part of like a core part of Terraform is just trying to improve uh, Terraform in a team environment uh, and trying to improve the safety around Terraform because when Terraform doesn't do something right, it could be really scary since it's, it's managing infrastructure. Um, in the worst case, obviously, you don't want it to destroy things it shouldn't, but you also just don't want it to not realize it already created something or something like that. So we've been working around how do we uh, ensure safety and how do we understand all the safety boundaries of Terraform. <coughs> Uh, the major feature we ship towards this uh, is called remote backends. Um, remote backends are the mechanism by which you could store, lock, um, and do actually other things coming out here. Uh, uh, store and lock state with Terraform in a remote, in a remote setting. Uh, and it has to be remote because you just need a synchronization point if you have a team. The way Terraform works is it's a desktop, or it's a desktop CLI, and, and you need some sort of coordination mechanism to ensure safety across the team. Uh, remote backends are a way to get that in a pluggable way. <coughs> uh, so what remote backends do is, if you're familiar with Terraform and you've used remote state in the past, it is a replacement for remote state. Um, it's backwards compatible if you've upgraded, but it's a, it's a replacement. Um, it's a superset. It does, it does what remote state used to do, but it also does and enables a lot more things like locking, uh, environments, and more. Um, you're able to configure this now from Terraform files. So it's not just the command line interface, which we had before, um, but that still exists too. Uh, it could detect configuration changes. <clears throat> so an issue with remote state before was that even if you set it up, um, if someone changed the S3 bucket to point from A to B, there was nothing that, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it was <clears throat> there was nothing that forced the other members of the team to know that that happened. And so if there wasn't, if the team member didn't broadcast to the team that, oh, I moved the bucket for the state, everyone would happily keep working and you'd get these diverged states. Uh, and diverging's kind of bad, but merging's pretty impossible. So um, that's where it became really terrible. Um, so it now detects configuration change and will not let other team members uh, run things if there was a change until they update. Uh, it also forces new users of Terraform to initialize. So uh, similar to the configuration change, when you had a new team member, there was nothing that forced them to adopt the remote state. So if they accidentally ran Terraform Apply, they would just create a complete clone of your infrastructure that, that didn't necessarily affect your old infrastructure, but you had double the resources. It's not what they expected. Um, and now you could, now it forces new users to actually set that up. Uh, and then the last thing we did was introduce uh, this command Terraform init. We actually didn't introduce the command since it already existed, we just changed the behavior. Um, and what Terraform init is, is it's the one command to set everything up. So the workflow that we're pushing is any new user runs Terraform init before anything else. It's safe to run multiple times if you're not sure if you ran it already. Uh, but that'll set up all your remote backends, it'll download any external modules. Uh, in the future it's going to be downloading uh, providers as well, if, uh, if you external providers. Um, verifying sort of version constraints and things like that. Uh, and Terraform forces you to run init. If you don't run init, it knows you didn't, and so it'll tell you to. <clears throat> so here's an example of what configuring a backend would look like. Uh, it's, you just put it in the file. It's pretty straightforward. I think it's what you would expect. Um, and when you run Terraform init, it sets everything up. Um, if, if you're a new user that didn't run init, for example, and tried to run a command, it would tell you that you need to do that, but it also tells you why. And so there's actually, I think, like a matrix of 17 or so reasons of why you would need to run in it. And so it tells you why in every case. So at least you're, you're hopefully less confused at why would I run that command. It's, you know, you did, you never, con you never done the initial configuration. You've never, it's changed. Um, various things could happen. And so with remote backends, the focus was on safety. We've been, we've been trying to increase, uh, decrease the amount of scenarios in which you could corrupt state. Uh, that was just the primary point where everyone would be really, really happy with Terraform, and if state got corrupted, it would pretty, it would go, you know, 100 to zero really fast for you. Um, and so what remote backends do is add a whole new layer of safety um, from things like detecting changes, like I said, um, but we also added things like checking something we call lineage. If you tried to, 
write to a state which didn't originate from that same configuration, we don't let you. Um, it's 99% it's of the time indicative of something really terrible about to happen. Um, we disallow writing unsafe states. So we maintain serial numbers. You can't write over a state of the serial numbers changed. Um, if writing to the remote backend fails uh, for any reason, we also keep a copy locally. Um, so that's the only case in which we write things locally. Uh, if writing the local file fails, we output it to the console. If you don't have a console, then you lost your state. But I think that you know, those are reasonable fallbacks. Um, uh, we also don't ever put, the, besides that one safety scenario, we don't ever write the state to disk. So state, remote backends actually give you a really great story now for not having your secrets show up on your disk. The, the way it works is when you run Terraform, we request uh, the state from the remote side. We only hold it in memory. Uh, and then we write it back and we throw it away. Uh, the only time it ever goes to disk is if the write remotely failed and you get a really, really big, really loud red message. So you should know that that happened. Uh, and then the last thing, kind of understated but also super important, is state locking. Um, so when you run Terraform Apply now with a remote backend, uh, it blocks anyone else from running a Terraform Apply. Um, actually, this, this goes across any command that could possibly write state. So refresh, um, apply, all the state the advanced state modification subcommands, um, all of those will lock the state. We don't lock it for reading. So reading, you just get the last write wins. Um, whatever happened, you get. Uh, but for, for anything that could write, uh, we lock it. And that makes it highly unlikely that you would overwrite each other, um, in addition to all these other checks that we're now doing. Uh, so that was remote backends. Some other sort of highlights over the past, the past like six months um, has been conditionals, basic conditionals, not full, full blown conditionals. But um, you could conditionally change the value of an attribute in Terraform now. Uh, and there's some really powerful uh, scenarios for this. You could, you could dynamically change the count, for example. So if you don't want a resource in development, you could actually do count equals zero if the environment is development. Otherwise, count equals three or something. Uh, we want to expand the support for conditionals in the future, but that at least gives you uh, something to start working with. Uh, there's the Vault and Nomad provider, so trying to integrate better with our other tools. Uh, Vault is an awesome way so that you don't need provider credentials in your Terraform configuration anymore. You could pull AWS credentials from Vault, use it to configure the AWS provider, and then spin up AWS resources. Uh, and the Nomad provider is a great way to configure Nomad as well as just set up initial like system level jobs. For example, if you run uh, a monitoring agent on every single machine, you probably want to set that up with Terraform rather than make the command Terraform apply and then Nomad run. You could just do Terraform apply to get all that, the, all the system level jobs going. Um, and then, like I said, the, the growth in providers and resources uh, is, is really, really crazy. There's over 75 now. Um, I think if you count all the open pull requests for providers, we have over 100. So that's just growing really, really fast. And, and that's the goal of Terraform is to support every provider and every resource um, so that you can manage any infrastructure as code with Terraform. Uh, and then the last one I want to talk about is Packer. Um, and Packer is actually the first tool uh, that we ever launched as HashiCorp Incorporated. Uh, Vagrant came prior to the company. Um, and Packer finally, uh, after four years, uh, reached the 1.0 milestone, um, which was a monumental effort by a few people uh, in the company to get it to this point. Um, it sort of represents uh, both a commitment from us to a, a, a long-term stability, but also just a representation uh, of the reach uh, of the tool and the workflow being successful. Um, Packer's workflow, its configuration has changed very, very slightly over the past two years. Um, Packer itself is over four years old, um, and that's pretty. It's a pretty good indicator to us that it's it's good for a 1.0. And so, we spent uh, a good part of the end of last year. Uh, in the beginning of this year, just drilling down issues to make sure that we're not missing anything terrible um, with, with Packer. And the Packer team did a really incredible job of getting us down from 1,000 issues and PRs uh, down to about 150. And the vast majority of those 150 were feature requests. So um, <clears throat> the, the issue count went, went way, way down. Um, as part of the process, we got a do dozens of sort of new builders, provisioners, post-processors, things like Azure support things like um, building EBS volumes themselves rather than full Amazon machine images. You could just create uh, EBS volumes um, and various other things. So there's just a ton of stuff that showed up in there um, in addition to the 1.0. Uh, and so that's out now. 
Uh, and so those are the six. Uh, those are our six tools, and the and what we've been up to with each of them. Um, the the thing I kind of want to like leave with you is that the six tools. You know, we have a theme uh, for each of them. We we have an overarching mission with the company, but we like to drive our individual product development with some sort of theme because we don't want to just ship, you know, one feature or one point improvement to solve one thing. When when the issue is something with console like how do we improve operator happiness. We want to take a look at what are, what are six ways we could uh, improve operator happiness. And, and if we're in that context, we try to knock out as much as we can to a reasonable extent. So we operate under these themes. Um, and these themes are generally driven by what users, so the community is asking for, what we're seeing with customers. Um, and so um, you know, things like open spaces, things like these events are a great way uh, for you to share. And, and we're all here to listen of the problems you're facing or the things you'd like to solve. Um, and those do help drive our roadmap significantly. Um, and that's it. So thank you very much uh, for coming and have a good Hashi Days. <laughs>